Hi, welcome to JJ's Productions. We've got another Stoke City vlogcast. With me as always is Jan. How are you doing? Once again, I'm okay, thanks. I hope that you're okay as well, folks. So, we got a win against Ipswich, and I'm not sure how I feel about the win just based on the performance. Um, from what we heard on the radio, it was a bit of a dire show, and there only seemed to be a certain number of fans who were actually sticking up for the performance, so I am wondering what the general consensus is of this viewership. Was it a good game, or was it as bad as they made out? Well, in my opinion, I thought it was a bit of a chronic game. I wasn't excited. I mean, I think the goals were good, you know, yep. I've seen them on the highlights, they seem quite good goals, especially Alan's finish, uh, but it didn't seem like there was a lot going on around them. <laughs> well, I've made a comment here, you know, we may have won 2-0 against Ipswich, but blimey, we weren't great, and we weren't even good. Yeah. I it's a bit awkward because I remember before this episode, uh, sorry, in the last episode, I did say that I thought we might get a 1-1 or a draw. And I did have comments coming at me saying, seriously, you don't think we'll beat the bottom team of the league? And I'm thinking, it's not that the squad couldn't do it, it's just that I don't back them to do it. And I think that performance sort of demonstrates why I don't back them, because... Just supposing in seven scored before half time, I'm not convinced that Alan's goal would have come, mm. or at least not as come as easily. Well, let's face it. Once again, Mr. Rowett has decided to put a different team on. Yeah, again, I'm you know, with you there. But we need a bit of consistency, and he isn't offering it. It's ridiculous what he's doing. No, none of the team are getting used to playing against each other, are they? I think the only player who's benefiting right now in terms of consistent selection is Sam Klukas. You know, every game he's played, he's got an assist, so I think his inclusion has been quite good recently. Yeah, but, you know, we were getting this on Bojan. Why isn't he playing Bojan? Well, the official line, as it was stated before the game, is that he isn't offering enough compared to other options and he wants Bojan to have more effect in the forward areas, if I remember right. And I can't help but think, so does that mean that he considers Bojan only as a forward player? So that would mean either the number nine, which is Fabio Berahino currently, or as a wide forward, so that would be Ince McLean, Berahino the, the other game. You know, you're thinking, where does he see him? Because personally, I champion him as a number eight. I, you know, I'm yeah. one of the three midfielders. And I know some people say, well, that doesn't suit him, but I think... He could play the role if he was trained into it. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I back Bojan to do is adapt if given a challenge. And for me, he hasn't been given that sort of confidence to fill that role. I mean, we're playing McLean. Now, I see McLean as a bruiser. A little bit, yeah. You know, and he'll go in... I don't mean that nastily either. <laughs> no, and, you know, he'll go in and do the dirty. Bojan is a footballer. Yeah. And he'll go and he'll dodge around players and make passes and he'll be there for gathered ball again. I Whereas once McLean has done his bruise a bit and got the ball, mm -hmm. he just passes it. This is where I'm a little bit interested to Gary Rowett's mindset in the sense that Ryan Woods has become such a crucial part of the team in some ways. Since he came in and there has been a sharp upturn in form, yeah, I can't help but wonder if Allen can perform the Woods role. You know, because when I first started watching Joe Allen closely when he was playing for Wales, he did a similar job to Woods in the sense that he was the deepest one in the midfield, he'd be open to receive the ball and play a simple pass into Aaron Ramsey or whoever was in the Welsh team. And I can't help but wonder why if Stoke never tried him like that. Yeah. You know, it's always been as a box-to-box -box midfielder or a number 10. I mean, according to some people on Twitter, apparently he was playing as a second striker at the weekend, and you're thinking, why have him that far up the pitch? Yeah. Especially when his best performances, at least in my opinion, have been deeper. You know, and Exactly. The only reason I bring up the deeper option is because I'm not exactly calling for Woods to be dropped, because I do believe he has played well, and I'm not dismissing any of that. But, in games where we're expected to 
take control to have the possession. Wouldn't it be better to have just one of these types of players on the pitch? It's a bit like Chelsea at the moment. They've got Jorginho, who's pretty much the playmaker, but he plays from deep. And you've got Conte, who's used to being the ball winner, but he's having to win the ball higher up the pitch, which yeah. he isn't suited to. And I can't help but wonder, could, like Chelsea, with maybe dropping Jorginho, could uh, we afford to just keep our Kante in, you know, with the Joe Allen? It's a conundrum for Gary Rowett, but I can't help but ask the question because I feel like we do need to give Bo a chance, a, a run of games at number eight. Yeah, That's definitely. my personal opinion. So. Again, those in the know at the club might say, you know what, we have tried him in training here, he doesn't really look suited to it. And if that's the case, then I have to just bow my head to their knowledge. But equally, I can't help but think Barcelona graduates tend to have a bit of adaptability about them, mm -hmm. in the sense that they are trained to play multiple positions. It's sort of like part of the culture of growing up at La Masia. Yeah. And I can't help but think, surely he's capable of at least trying number eight. Well, I think so. I mean, he's one of my favourite players anyway. And I yearn to see him play more. I mean, I think, if anything as well, it would take a little bit of the pressure off Rowett because the more he ostracises Bojan, the harder it is to keep the fans on side. I mean, one goal goes against, suddenly it's like, well, why is Bojan on the bench? And I do get the arguments that Rowett's defenders have got here in the sense that it's Stoke City FC, not, Rowett, uh, not Bojan FC. You know, yeah, I don't yeah. ever believe that one player is bigger than the manager or the club. No. No. But equally, I can't help but look at the options off on the bench the other day and think, just supposing it had remained nil-nil, you know, because like I say, that inch goal before half-time, that was, it came at the last possible minute, let's say. And then, like I say, if that hadn't gone in, would the Allen chance have come as easily? So I'm looking at a nil-nil situation and thinking, who do you bring on? Yeah. And in that game, we've got Crouch, Juf, mm -hmm. McLean, and after that you've got Fletcher, Sorensen and Martins Indy. For me, the only one who could really come on and maybe alter things a little bit is McLean. And he's not that creative. You know, no. he's, like you said, he's a bit of a bruiser. And yeah. as much as he might mix things up a little bit, I wouldn't like to bring him on to chase a game. No, I don't think he's a brilliant player. As I say, if we're playing a tough team, you know, who've got um, sturdy players as well, who are, you know, fouls and, yeah. you know, he's one who can get in there and win the ball for us. Yeah, it's like he'd be first picked when we play Middlesbrough, oddly enough, the team who he had yeah. all that poppy for all over. Yeah, but uh, moving on from that, I don't think our Jack had a good game. I'm going to say, I think with Jack, I'm always looking at his feet rather than his hands, which some people will disagree with. And for me, he's obviously always doing well with his uh, hands, you know, his glove work, he's making good saves. My question is always, is he distributing the ball well enough? No, he isn't. Because I know it's you like might... that saying, cost kick a bow. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we can't. <laughs> I, I only go on about distribution because I think the better distribution of a ball, the more likely it is that we keep possession and he won't have to make a save. Yeah. So... It is important to a degree, you know, I, I I'm not encouraging him to suddenly play like Edison or uh, Alisson or any of these fancy damn Brazilian, you know, sweeper keepers, but equally, there should be a bit of neat and tidiness about your footwork, yeah. and I think you pick up on it a lot, that he tends to swerve the ball at goal kicks, like he goes to the left hand side yeah. of the pitch or the right, and I think maybe if he could just get a bit more accuracy on his long balls... Yep. It would be beneficial to the team. And another thing I've noticed with him, and you who go to the match will notice it more than me listening to it is, he tends to get the ball now and either throw it out quick or definitely kick it quick and there's nobody there. Or he kicks it that quick, it goes into where the tunnel is or the opposite side. I know, you know. What, I know what you're getting at. I think I'm, I'm not overly critical there, just in the sense that I'd rather a goalkeeper try to do a fast delivery. For me, that's at the fault of the players. They should be running into space. Yeah. Well, but, so don't. 
but it may be. <laughs> well, they should. You know, but for me, yeah, that is the... Well, they don't. But this is what I'm getting at. If Jack's trying to release the ball fast, there should be at least three players trying to run into space so that they can receive a throw or a kick or whatever fast delivery he's offering. And I don't cr criticise him for that because if he's trying to deliver a ball, if he can get it into a good area, then it's the player's responsibility to get onto it. If he delivers it into a bad area, it is Jack's fault, unfortunately. But that's I mean, where Nigel I'm focusing John right now. Nigel Johnson said on Saturday, I was listening to Radio Stoke, and he made the same comment as me. Why has he kicked the ball out so quick when there's nobody there to get it? And he did refer to the match before uh, Reading, was it? Yeah. Um, that he did the same there, that there was no players there to kick, so why didn't he hold on to it just for a couple of seconds until there was somebody in position? I'm changing topic, but it is a similar point of recurring problems, and there was an instance in the second half, right before the Joe Allen goal, where we had a free kick, and if it, everyone was in the box bar, I think, I think it was Ryan Woods or Sam Lucas won the two, and Eric Peters took the free kick and he had to play it short to one of the, whoever it was, Woods or Klukas. And because they were already being pressed by the time the ball was received, he had to play it all the way back to Jack. So from having a free kick in the attacking area, we'd play the ball back to goal. Now, that got Rowett angry because the fans got on his back yeah. and it got e Ecker angry. Next thing you know, we go up the Ecker for end and score. So the question I would ask is, why do we mess around so much like that? Yeah. And equally, do the players think they're doing this? Or do they know they're doing this? It's very hard to understand because you don't... I mean, Eric's reaction would suggest that he thinks, what have I done wrong? Yeah. But equally, the players at the front end that, who aren't really offering options for Eric to deliver the ball in, they should be doing more. Mm. Again, it relates to what you were saying about Jack and you know not having any runners for quick release balls. For me, there should be options at set pieces, and maybe that's just an area where the team need to work collectively and say, right, if we've got a set piece, we're going to do this routine. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't seem to have anything like that. I think part of the problem there as well is we haven't got a set piece taker. So, no, we so I'll admit, we're running a little bit behind here, so we're going to get on to Jan's stats, because I don't, even though there is a little bit of Stoke news, we'll cover that at the end, I think. Right, well, nothing exciting, folks. Uh, they've won eight... They've drawn eight and they've lost five. And the top scorer is Abraham with eight. And then you've got Hutton, Chester and Fuja, what's his name? Kodja. Kodja, that's it. Who's coming in and scoring three or four as well. Um, but there seems to be quite a lot of the team that can score goals. Yeah. Okay, Abraham, he scored the eight. But... You just see other players coming in, and anybody, I think, by the looks of it, is willing to have a go at goal. Well, at the beginning of this match footage, they did show a stat for Tammy Abraham, and they are reflective of real life, and I'm sure it said something like 6 in 3. And mm. it does seem like Tammy's in a bit of good form, and he is an England striker, i.e., you know, he has played for England, so I will always sort of have a eye on them, even if in this instance I can't say I'm rooting, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I'm glad that he's at least having a better season than he was at Swansea yeah. last year, but equally I hope he has an off day at the weekend. But well, yeah. I'll carry on, the yellow cards they've got are 30, they've had two red cards, currently they're in 8th and we're in 10th, and ifs, buts and maybes, if we win against Villa, well, if, when we win against Villa on Saturday and Birmingham lose, we will be in eighth. Which would be quite a good position going into the Christmas period. Yeah. So it would be very good if we could get the win. Yeah. But let's see how it goes, because I've got to admit, Villa is a very tough place to go right now in the sense that Dean Smith's come in and I think he's just simplified matters for Villa. I mean, I saw one of their games at the start of the season. And they've got a really weird back line. They've got centre half Twan, Twan Zabi at right back. They've got midfielder Yadinak at centre half. And they've got right back Hutton at left back. Now, I know that might just seem like, okay, that's only the same as us doing this, that, and the other. But I can't help but think 
it was just too many square pegs in round holes. You can maybe afford one or two, but that was three in a back line. Mm. And I'm just looking at this and thinking, in that same game, because I have had a look, that um, Ahmed al Ahmadi, i am trying to say his name right, he was on the bench and he's been a right back that Steve Bruce at the time has trusted for a long time. So why wasn't he drafted in for that game and maybe Twan Zabi partner in Chester? Again, for me, it's just forcing awkward issues. I mean, Jednak did play a bit at centre-half last season, but his stock and trade is midfield. So it baffles me why Bruce went down that route, and it seems like Dean Smith coming in has just rectified those issues, issues a little bit, even if maybe the Jednak issue was down to injuries. I've got to say, I felt sorry for Steve Bruce. I must be one of the only Steve Bruce likers <laughs> in the bloody country, I think. Well, put like this, the Bo when you hear the Boo N doing the Cameron Jones song, I think you might actually be the only one. <laughs> <laughs> but I liked him as a player. Um, you know, when he played with Pallister, you know, I mean, to me, they were the super duo. Yeah. You know, and I've liked him since. And even when we sang the song, Who Wet All The Pies, he did actually <laughs> wave, you know. And I'll give him credit, he does seem game for a fair laugh. So as far as, you know, opposition banter yeah. or whatever you want to call it, he did seem okay with it, which I think as far as the fans liking a bit of a laugh and a joke, it's good to see. But I think quickly we've got to turn to the, the under-23s game against uh, the Vale. Yeah, we're just going to touch on that before we do predictions, just for the fact that it was a bad day for Stoke City in general. I mean, it, it's annoying because it isn't the fan, the majority fan base. It's a few isolated individuals who thought, let's go out and cause trouble. I don't even think they were football supporters. They hit on it and they thought, right, time for a good scrap here. And... How many Stoke supporters do you see in the crowd, really, with hoodies on, scarves over the faces? Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. don't. There is one thing that came to light after the game, and it was just a discussion between the two of us. And you were saying to me, this is why I wouldn't go a Vale match, yeah. just for the fact that you know there's going to be trouble. And I did see that sentiment echoed across Twitter quite a bit, and I couldn't help but think, if more people who have that mindset, who are able to go, said, right, I'm going to the game, less people who are like those who got into the ground would have been there. So yeah. it's just a little challenge to those who do have that mindset, if ever this comes up again, that maybe it would be worth taking a chance. And I can understand your reasons for not going, because I've got to admit, if mum was fit, I don't think you'd go. But... There is the argument of the more people who are sensible, who actually want to see a local rivalry yeah. without causing trouble, the more people that go to the game in with that mindset, the less people that are just complete tossers, they can't go. Yeah, yeah. You know, it just spoils football, and we've been labelled again as the bad ones. And we shouldn't, because I swear to God that they weren't football supporters. Well, if they were, they deserved to have the tag taken off. Them. Yeah, and when they were jumping on that poor lady's car and saying, go on, Stoke, that, how do, they don't know Stoke a bit. Well, I bet they've never even been to Stoke itself, never mind the football. Even if they were, you know, associated with Stoke, even if, like, maybe they used to follow us on the TV or something, they shouldn't be associated with us anymore. No. That's my view. The, the well, moment I, you cause trouble in a match like that and bring the club's name into disrepute, you're out of here. Well, I hope that they're all named and shamed. I really do, because I hate violence of any shape and form, and it spoils the art of football. I mean, I will... It, it pains me to say, but I will congratulate Vale as far as actually winning the game, because it does seem like those... It was a bad atmosphere as far as yeah. the Stoke end goes. I know they were three and a lot by the time half time came, but you know it was probably a nothing game to them in the sense that you know yes, it's a local rivalry, but you don't really want to be beating an under twenty ones team. So no. yeah, I'll give them credit for that. A little bit of credit as well to the Vale supporters for, who didn't cause trouble because I don't believe there were any who really got into trouble. But equally, yeah. you know, they could have risen, retaliated, whatever. So. I think that, I'm like Stoke, there's good football supporters at Vale. Yeah. I mean, 
we know a lot of them. Oh yeah, to be honest, yeah. I've got a little thing going where, wherever I seem to go in working circles, I always meet a Vale supporter. You know, when you're at school with uh, Vale supporters and so on. Yeah. You know, but there's good and bad in everything. But they have made Stoke Luke the pits, and I hate it because we got rid of that label yeah. years ago. And um, I think it's a shame that we're being labelled like that again. Well, if anything, it hurts just because it's right at home that this yeah. will hit in the sense that, no, it, as much as I've just praised Vale, they will now be able to rub that in our yeah. faces for quite a while. Yeah, they you will. cause trouble here. So, yeah, yeah um, disgusting in those that cause the trouble. And uh, to be honest, I want nothing to do with them as far no. as calling them anything related to Stoke anymore. Yeah, I'm very passionate about it. And. Uh, it hasn't sat very well with me at all. So we've got about a minute left and we need to do predictions for the Villa game. So apologies to the Villa fans as well if we haven't talked much about your team, but we will try and cover them all in the reverse fixture. So what are your thoughts? Aston Villa 1, Stoke City 2. You know what, I do like that prediction. Um, just because I don't want to match it exactly, I'm going to go for the 1-1, one, one, which... Again, it repeated the gameplay, but I must admit something shone on it a little where I thought, you know, it could be a case of Villa taking the lead and we get an equaliser, but I'm going to go with a more accurate prediction if we've got the time, which is if Stoke score first, I don't think Villa will respond. If Villa score first, it could be any score line for the simple reason they've got goals in them and when we go behind, I think we'd be chasing the game. So we might get one back, but they could get two or three more. So, so what is your prediction? I've gone for 1-1, one, one, but... Um, There's no buts in this game. But I went for an added caveat. Which is... If Don't Stoke... you start using big words with me. Six no. letters. <laughs> you use more on Scrabble. <laughs> right, folks. Okay, so thank you for listening. Hope to see you again soon. If you enjoyed this video, please leave it a like. And if you're enjoying the Stoke City Vlogcast, subscribe to the channel for future episodes. Okay, see you folks. Have some comments to us and we will mention you. Bye for now everyone. Bye.